Hey everyone, Houston Math Prep here. We want to talk to you about what a surface of revolution is, where the formula comes from. We'll do some more example videos to give you an idea of how to complete these problems fully. If we look at a function in the plane, um, some sort of a curve, and we revolve it about an axis, just the surface, so we're not actually creating a solid object using the region between the curve and the axis, but just revolving the curve itself. That's going to trace out a nice surface for us here. The idea of generating a surface area calculation with an integral really comes from the idea of taking then a bunch of microscopic pieces of this curve and what do we do when we sum up many, many of those pieces and we just revolve a piece around an axis, we will get a tiny little bit of surface area and we will sum up all of those surface areas. Um, so you'll notice we're going to use actually something that involves arc length. So I have my formula written here just to remind us from our arc length video. Now I do want to warn you, we are going to move very quickly through the mathematically pure 100% correct way to develop the formula. And then we are going to give you an actual intuitive way to see this formula and hopefully our intuitive way will stick with you and give the formula just a bit more meaning when you're using it. The way that we are supposed to build a surface of revolution is based on adding up an infinite number of frustums. So talking through really quickly here because we want to get to the more intuitive version of how to think of this actual formula that we're getting. So we're going to speed this up a bit. So you have a height and you have a slant height and you have two different radii and this is basically the lateral surface area of part of a cone. Uh, and the idea is in order to figure out this area we look at you know finding the average of the two radii multiplying by pi multiplying by the slant height um, and then we break down those radii as some parts of a function and we look at some subinterval on that function and then we multiply by what we know to be the arc length formula and then we get this long expression involved delta x and subintervals. At that point we then say that because we're on some sort of continuous function there is some sort of halfway point between these two function values that we can use multiplies out we get a nice 2 pi and then our x sub i's become this nice formula involving an integral. That's a lot to really think intuitively so what we're going to do is simply present it this way whether it is a hundred percent mathematically accurate or not. Uh, intuitively what we're doing is we're taking a tiny little bit of arc length and I am going to revolve it about some sort of an axis. And each of those pieces will travel in a circular motion around that axis, and each piece will generate a circumference. And so remember, the formula for a circumference is going to be 2 pi times the radius. And if you think about uh, an axis running through the middle of this, then the radius is actually going to be the distance from the axis to the function itself. In other words, the radius is just the function value. So we can think of 2 pi r as we revolve about the axis as actually 2 pi times the function itself. 2 pi is a constant, so we can bump out 2 pi. So while this may only be about 99% accurate as far as how to think of this formula, I think it's much more intuitive to see this 2 pi r as circumference times how we've already been doing arc length in terms of the integral formula. So this will be our formula for surface area that we're going to use. Um, if you need to go back and you know check out how a frustum works and all the pieces of that and build that actual proof yourself, you're welcome to do that, but we're going to skip that part in this video. Uh, here we've got the versions of the surface area formula, both in terms of a function of x and a function of y. For surface area of revolution, just make sure you remember that if the surface is generated by revolving about the x-axis, then you'll integrate dx. If it's revolved about y, then you'll use dy. Um, you'll notice that you have a function outside, and then you also have a derivative of a function squared inside. So getting something that is easily integrable by hand will usually involve some sort of a u substitution for your integral, or possibly distributing the function into the radical and then integrating that way. Um, because of the 
messiness of this formula with a function times a root and a root has a bunch of stuff in it that involves derivatives of functions. These problems are pretty picky, so you will notice very specific types of simple functions or very particular looking functions that will work to be integrable by hand with these. All right, we have three example videos. Check those out where we work fully through three separate examples, uh, each a little different. Thanks for watching everyone. We'll see you in the next one.